Good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us here tonight uh, in person uh, or virtually. Uh, I'm pleased that uh, so many of you were able to be here in person. Uh, technically, at a price of zero, we sold out of tickets tonight. Uh, so thank you for being part of that. Uh, so I'm particularly happy to see so many of you out under the circumstances for a topic that is often controversial and so easily politicized. Uh, I want to assure you at the outset that our speaker, who self-describes himself as an openly nerdy man who loves role-playing games and graphic novels, is one of the least political people that I know. Uh, and uh, this is something that uh, you know, I'm well aware of, of watching the social media of the Institute over the past couple weeks of many people commenting on it with various kind of ad hominem attacks on the speaker, the Institute, or the university overall being some liberal biased place who clearly hasn't been paying attention to what the Free Market Institute has been doing for about the last eight years with our various events and speakers that we have on, on campus. I've, very, I've been very conscientious that the Institute is neither conservative or liberal in the political sense, but as a community of scholars who are interested in ideas, particularly interested in ideas as they relate to, to individual liberty and human freedom, and the role that freedom and free enterprise play in, in bettering the human condition, uh, and that tonight's talk is related to that, and that we support open discourse on, on controversial topics. Uh, you know, tonight we have a particularly gifted thinker, I think, who shares many of the same values that I do, but who will argue for a conclusion that will be challenging for a lot of the people who are usually fans of institute lectures and the conclusions that many speakers here are pushing. I want to give, encourage you all to give him a fair hearing with an open mind and explore whether some of the arguments he makes uh, that lead to conclusions perhaps different than what you came in with uh, are something that should be considered. Uh, so with that, let me introduce our speaker. Our speaker is Professor Brian Kaplan, who's a professor of economics at George Mason University and now a New York Times best-selling author. He received his PhD from Princeton and his undergraduate degree from Berkeley. He's the author of The Myth of the Rational Voter, a book the New York Times named the political book of the year. He's also author of Selfish Reasons to Have More Kids, which he believes in so vigorously that he's a father of four. Uh, <clears throat> He is also the author of The Case Against Education, uh, and most recently, Open Borders, that he co-authored with Saturday Morning Breakfast serialist Zach Weinersmith. Uh, he actually, just this afternoon, presented some of his research on his most recent, or his work in progress book, uh, Poverty, Who to Blame. In addition to writing his books, he blogs at EconLog, he's published in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, Time, Newsweek, The Atlantic, scholarly journals such as the American Economic Review, the Economic Journal, the Journal of Law and Economics, and many others. He's appeared on ABC, BBC, Fox News, MSNBC, C-SPAN, and I'm proud to call him a friend of mine. Brian, welcome back to Texas Tech. Thank you so much for that kind of introduction, Ben, and thanks to the Free Market Institute for having me, and thanks to all of you people for actually showing up for an in-person event. This is the first in-person event I have done since March. So, I missed you. You've never seen me before, but I missed you. <laughs> All right, uh, so why don't we get started? Okay. Uh, by the way, so on the cover, that is actually me there with uh, my wife and the best man at my wedding and then some fictional characters and the Statue of Liberty. Um, so let's just begin with the social value of laborability. We are in Texas. I remember, I was here seven years ago, which to my mind is barely any time at all, and yet during that time, this city has been transformed. The last time I was here, you had your Virgin Hotel, you had your Walmart, and I don't remember there being anything in between. This morning, I walked the same route that I did seven years ago, and it was packed with new development. And I'm thinking a lot of that new development reflects new people that have moved to Lubbock from other parts of the state, other parts of the country, other parts of the world. Now, why is it that people are moving to Texas? Because things work a lot better in Texas, clearly. All right? Now, people you know, in free labor markets, workers tend to move from places where wages are low to places where wages are high. Of course, when you're thinking about wages, you need to think about the whole standard of living that you get. You can officially have a high wage in San Francisco, but what does it really buy you? A closet. So, who cares? Better to be in Lubbock, right? Of course. All right. Now, when 
workers move from a place where the wages are low to a place where the wages are high, this obviously benefits the workers themselves, right? But they're not the only beneficiaries. You know, the only benefit, the sole beneficiaries of movement are not just the movers, right? Why? Because in a free labor market, wages and productivity are very closely linked. The reason you're getting paid more to be in one location rather than another is because you accomplish more. You produce more for society in one location rather than another. Uh, in general, workers who earn low wages usually do not produce very much for society. The extras in a movie, how much entertainment did they really add? A little bit. It wouldn't be the same scene without the extras, but they didn't do that much. On the other hand, the star of the picture, he's earning a lot of money because he's adding a lot to the entertainment of the audience. And of course, the same goes in almost every other line of work that you think about. All right. Uh, what this means is that when workers move, in order to raise their own wages, they are also, as if by an invisible hand, increasing the amount of wealth that they are producing for humanity. It's an important point. When someone moves from a remote location where they're just doing subsistence farming in order to get a better life for themselves in Lubbock, they aren't just getting a better life for themselves, they are now contributing more to other people because they're offering the new and improved goods and services that they're making for sale to the market. All right. And no, this is equally true for high and low skilled workers. Yes, a high skilled worker can benefit by moving from, say, a rural area of Oklahoma to Austin. But on the other hand, also a low skilled worker can benefit in the same way and can benefit society in the same way. Right? When someone moves to live near Bill Gates in order to work as his butler, they're saving Bill time. And with that saved time, Bill is then able to contribute more to the rest of the world. So now I've been teaching two in-person classes, so I've been getting more and more used to reading people's expressions from eyes alone. So it's not, it is a harder skill than having the whole face, but I'm trying anyway. All right, so now this logic, what I've just been describing to you, still remains true across national borders. When workers move to higher wages, they aren't just enriching themselves, they are enriching the world. When a Mexican farmer who would produce a very small amount of corn home in Mexico because they're doing subsistence agriculture there, moves up to work on an industrialized farm in Lubbock. Like, do you have corn farms here? I saw some corn farms in between here and- Sort of. Uh, sort of. But I did see corn in between here and Amarillo. All right, so he moves there. All right, when a Mexican farmer moves there, he isn't just getting higher wage for himself, he's producing more corn for the world because he is now producing the corn under much better circumstances. All right, so now think you can also reverse this. So imagine this. How much could you think you could accomplish in a village of rural Mexico? You just get parachuted in there. This is your new home. You can't leave. What could you do with your life there? All right, say, well, I could telework. Maybe I could keep doing my job. Eh, maybe. But there are a lot of restrictions on your opportunities there. And it is not just a tragedy for you. It's a tragedy for your customers the people that you are no longer able to deliver the full productivity that you have to offer are impoverished by this as well. Thought experiment that I, that I have in the book, uh, Antarctica. All right, so imagine you've got a million farmers stuck in Antarctica. They're farming the snow. They're eking out a miserable existence. What happens if you let the farmers move to another place where the agricultural conditions are better? Say Argentina. All right, well, obviously the Antarcticans are better off. But they're not the only ones who are better off, because when they go to Argentina, they're gonna produce a lot more food than they were doing back in Antarctica, and they're not gonna eat all the new food that they grow, they're gonna sell it. And who's gonna wind up benefiting from this increase in the world, probably the world supply of food? It's gonna be everyone who eats will get to share in the benefit of moving this labor from a place where its productivity is low to a place where its productivity is high. All right, which then brings us to the key point of this talk, economically speaking. What is the main point of immigration restrictions? It is to stop what I'm talking about. It's to stop what I'm talking about. It is to stop economically beneficial movement from happening. It's to say that if you're born in a place of low productivity, you stay in a place of low productivity. All right. Now, do these restrictions actually stop immigration? My dad actually will tell you that the US has had open borders for the last 40 years. All right. Uh, is that actually true? Right? And the answer is no. It is definitely clear that immigration restrictions do stop a lot of movement. Uh, there are several ways that you can be convinced of this. So one is just to look at the black market prices that coyotes charge. This being Texas, I assume you're familiar with coyotes. 
right? The metaphorical coyotes. All right, so you look at the price that they charge. So Mexico is, a, is the cheapest country to get into the United States from illegally. And even there, they're generally charging several thousand dollars, actually more in recent years, which would be several years worth of work for a rural Mexican farm worker. Right now, you think people would pay several years worth of income to a smuggler to get them into a country where the border was open in the first place. That would be crazy. Have you ever paid several years income for something that's free? No, no, almost nobody does that, maybe a donor. Right? But uh, other than that, uh, people do not do that. So that's one sign. And of course, Mexico is actually a very cheap country to get in from if you, as you start going to more distant locations or if there's a water crossing, then the prices get to be extremely high. So again, getting in from China or Pakistan, probably about $75,000. And remember, does that money actually always work? If you pay $75,000 to sneak in from Pakistan, do you always get in, no problems? No, of course, a lot of times you get caught. Uh, now, for Mexico, what I understand, the market is so developed that it's often there's a money-back guarantee. <laughs> but from most places, there's not a money-back guarantee, it's take your chances. So people really are, or are working for many years in order to get in, which they would not do if the restrictions were not important. The restrictions were actually very important, right? Or another sign of how restricted the laws already are is just surveys. Just go around the world and ask people, would you like to permanently move to another country? What country would that happen to be? You'll see that about, about a billion people on Earth say they would like to permanently move to another country. Even more would like to go for work, right? Yet nowhere near that many have actually moved. All right, now, of course, you can't always believe surveys, but this is something where, if anything, people probably would understate their willingness to move because they're basically saying, yeah, I'd like to say adios to this country. There's a better place. I don't want to be here anymore. So if anything, people would be downplaying it, just like they exaggerate how much they go to church, for example. Maybe not here in Texas, I don't know. Probably you exaggerate it more, actually, because there's more social pressure to exaggerate. I'm guessing, you can tell me. All right, so surveys also say that vastly more people want to come than do, in fact, come. And the obvious explanation is that they don't come because they can't get in illegally. They can't get in legally, and illegally is really expensive. All right. So what do these restrictions accomplish? There is the obvious fact that they reduce the number of people who come, which I am not only do I not deny, I very strongly affirm the immigration restrictions work in the sense that they keep people from coming. In the same way, so I think drug laws do reduce consumption. I think when someone says drug laws don't reduce consumption, I'm like that's awfully hard to believe. This would be one of the few things where raising prices and punishing people doesn't change behavior. I think that would change behavior. Right? But what else do you accomplish by doing this? Right? You know, like if you were to go and close the border of Texas to people from other states, right? with Texas Rangers there ready to shoot, would that stop people from coming into Texas? I think it would. Right? But what else would happen? Right? So what do these restrictions accomplish? Uh, for starters, they impoverish humanity. Because again, the reason why people want to come is to make more money, but the reason they make more money is because they will accomplish more in the place where they want to go. When you say that people cannot go, then they are stuck where they started, and when they are there, they are contributing less to the global economy than they could. All right. When economists have tried to estimate how much is this depressing the production of mankind, the standard answer is something like, if anyone could work anywhere, the GDP of the world would double. The production of mankind would actually double. Right? Now, if you're wondering how this could be, it comes from two things. First of all, when people move, they gain a lot, which means the productivity is increasing a lot. And secondly, a whole lot of people want to come. When you multiply one big thing, the gain per person, by another big thing, the total number of people want to come, you get an astronomical thing, which is where the title of a famous article on this comes. It's called Trillion Dollar Bills on the Sidewalk. Uh, this is a reference to an old story about how an economist is someone if we saw a $20 bill on the sidewalk would walk right past. Why? Because if we're really there, someone would have already picked it up, right? <laughs> All right, so this they're this saying, well, here we have a trillion, a trillion dollar bills on the sidewalk. Trillions of dollars of gains for humanity. If only we would reach down and pick it up. It's like, well, then why hasn't somebody done it? Well, here's the catch. No one, you know, you, an individual can pick up a $20 bill, and that's why they do disappear very quickly. But can any one individual let in immigrants? Any regular person. Maybe a head of state could do it to some degree. But most people could not. You have to convince a whole lot of people to pick it up. So it's like a trillion dollar bill, but you're in a room of people saying, I don't believe it's a trillion dollar bill. What trillion dollar bill? I don't see anything there. Like, it's right there. And if you can't convince people, then nothing happens. All right. Okay. 
Um, now, so that's the first, first point so over here. That's immigration restriction to impoverish the world. Now, impoverishing the world impoverishes us. Most people analyze immigration policy ignore almost all these foregone gains. So you get a normal person's for immigration. Now, I love them, they're great people, but the arguments aren't nearly as good as they could be. Normal people will say, well, look at Sergey Brin. He's great, isn't he? Yeah, Sergey is great. Right? But most people aren't Sergey Brin. Saying Sergey Brin is great is not a good reason for bringing in farmers from Mexico. And I think bringing in farmers from Mexico is a good idea. Why? Because when you bring in farmers from Mexico, they produce more food. And who are they going to sell that food to? They're going to sell it to the world, including us. All right, so even most pro immigration writers normally just focus on high school immigration, where I would agree that the case is easier. But in a way, it's intellectually too easy. Saying, yes, do you want Albert Einstein in your country? Yeah, I think I want Albert. I think Albert would really pull his own weight. All right, but what about other people? And you know, the rare analysts who do acknowledge these gains that I'm talking about, though, usually dismiss them by just saying, well, sure, there are many trillions of dollars of gains to humanity by letting in farmers and nannies and people that will be butlers and people to work at chicken processing plants and so on. But almost all those gains will just go to the immigrants themselves, so who cares? So who cares? And I say this is a very strange argument because whenever the, uh, all the other examples that we have in history of large increases in production, the results have, have always been very broadly beneficial. Right? So for example, if you take a look at the benefits of the internet, is it only computer programmers who benefit from the internet? No. Everyone who uses the products of computer programmers benefits from the internet. Or how about the industrial revolution? Was that just a, be a benefit to the industrialists? Everyone else? Just kept going along as before, no, right? The industrialist makes a factory, the factory makes shirts, people wear the shirts, the people wearing the shirts get a piece of the pie. In fact, by most estimates, they get most of the pie, right? Or how about vaccines? Are the main beneficiaries of a COVID vaccine gonna be COVID vaccine manufacturers? No, they're like, if they're lucky, they'll get 1% of the gain and the rest will go to all the other people who can go back to enjoying normal life and not dying. Large increases in production are almost always broadly beneficial. So why would you not think that the increase in production from letting in a lot of immigrants would not also be broadly beneficial? Which again, would fit your experience as someone who has consumed the many goods that immigrants produce. You know, even my dad, who probably is the angriest critic of immigration I know, when he gets off the plane in Virginia, his first question is, can we get some of that Peruvian chicken? All right, which would not be there without those immigrants. All right. Now, since immigration restrictions do drastically reduce global production, they're almost surely impoverishing us too. Now, many people hear this, and isn't this just trickle-down economics? Isn't this just trickle-down economics? See, no, it's not trickle-down economics, it is Niagara Falls economics. Uh, so this is a page from the book, so yeah, do not go over Niagara Falls in a barrel, but so, except in art. All right, but anyway, so open borders is not trickle-down economics, it is Niagara, Niagara Falls economics. If you really could have a policy change that would double the production of the world, almost everyone would benefit personally. Not just immigrants, but people on both sides. Right? And again, you have to think about not just the competition in the labor market, but also the competition for your dollars. Okay, so what in the world are we losing? What exactly is it we would be losing? So tons of cheap products. If 40 years ago, someone had said, hey, there are going to be these Walmarts and Costco's, they're going to be great. People would have had a bunch of complaints and said, well, but think about all the jobs that we lost. And then, like, you know, these stores are too big. There's no one to tell you where to go and on and on. All right, now you got them. So do you appreciate them now? I just walked to the Walmart and I got two pillows for $3 each. I'm going to throw them away when I, before I go home. When I was a kid, we didn't throw away pillows. That was a day's labor, you know, a pillow back then. All right, so yeah, think about it in Walmart and Costco and steroids, just lots more cheap stuff. Uh, tons of cheap services. Again, like, the, the, this, this example is unfortunately temporarily not very compelling due to COVID, but just imagine we're in the great days of 2019. Remember Uber and how great it was? Right? How wonderful Uber was, the glory days. All right, think about lots more of that. Tons of cheap services. And again, this is important to keep in mind because the modern economy is almost entirely services. About 80% of modern economies are services. So occasionally people say, look, I understand the economic benefits of immigration, but why can't we keep the people away and just let their, their, their goods in? 
The answer is that's fine for food, it's fine for manufactured products. What about the other 80% of what people do? You can't have digital nannies, you can't have digital, you have virtual restaurants sending you virtual food. Because there are some kids' games who run a virtual restaurant, but they do not satisfy the appetites. So you need to have people actually come here and open their restaurants in order to benefit from having the skills of the people that are running those restaurants. Uh, something else, large increases in U.S. real estate value. When people come, they want to have some place to live. And in the short run, what's going to happen is that people are going to bid up the price of real estate. And what is the nationality of the owner of almost all real estate in the United States? United States? Almost all real estate in the U.S. is owned by people with American citizenship. So and even if you don't own it, do your parents own home? So, and then, of course, entrepreneurship and innovation. And again, remember, not all of this is high skill. When people talk about entrepreneurship, it's always back to Sergey Brin. He's great, but there's a lot of low-skilled entrepreneurship of immense value, like restaurants. Do you have super geniuses setting up restaurants? Generally not, but restaurants are great. It's really nice to have new restaurants. There's a lot more around here. I'm guessing a lot of people go here. So someone in Amarillo told me that rather going out to restaurants is what people in Amarillo do for fun. So I assume that could also be true in Lubbock, perhaps. So when I was a kid, it wasn't very fun to go to restaurants because there were only three restaurants, three kinds, anyway. So that's what it was. All right. Now, what about the effect on native wages and jobs? Uh, the answer is it all depends on whether immigrants produce what you produce or produce what you consume. Do the immigrants produce what you produce or do they produce what you consume? Yes, it is bad for you when immigrants produce what you produce. It is good for you when immigrants produce what you consume. So for me, the bad kind of immigrants are foreign-born professors, especially foreign-born economists, right? For me, they're a pain in the neck, right? It's because of them that I don't have a job at Harvard, right? If we just flush all the foreign-born economists out, then, you know, obviously I'd be at Harvard. There's no other explanation for, uh, for why I'm not there, right? Okay? Um, so that is a downside for me. Now, of course, Actually, I have many foreign more friends, and it's not just about money, right? I love my friends, but nevertheless, well, my career would still be probably going a lot better, but for you guys, you know, Canadians, for example. Right. Now, uh, however, the immigrant, however, like, like, is my job in any way endangered when the Afghan restaurant opens up into, across town? Are they going to take my job? No. They are people who are going to take my money in exchange for giving me tasty meals many times. All right. Uh, and the overall answer is you should always focus on immigration's net effect. Think about not just the effect on you as a worker, but think about the effect on you as a consumer. Right? And remember the basic point. The secret of mass consumption is mass production. If there is something that overall increases the production of humanity, then on average people in general are going to be benefiting from it. Yes, even with things like industrialization, there are definitely some farmers who are going to say, well, this particular combine is bad for me. But are you better or are you better or worse off because there was industrialization at all? That's where you really have to stretch to say, yeah, I guess I wish that we just stayed back in the Stone Age. That would be better for me. All right now, if you think that Americans should get even more from immigration, I'm not saying they should, but if you think this, then the prudent policy is to welcome them, say, glad to have you, but you're going to have to have you're going to, have to pay an admission fee or surtaxes or something else like that. And then you could use those proceeds to help any Americans that were harmed by the change. Uh, so why not? Well, uh, if you're about to say, well, this is all just a bunch of numbers. Numbers don't change people's minds. Yeah, I know. I know numbers don't change most people's minds. Now, since you're here, maybe numbers do change your mind. So I'm always an optimist. The people who come to the talk where you talk about numbers are probably people who like numbers, or at least kind of don't hate numbers. All right, but anyway. Estimates of massive economic gains rarely change people's minds about immigration, so why not? Uh, well, uh, people who do look over the numbers, in my experience, rarely challenge them. There are some very smart people who have heard this whole talk, and they're saying, yes, 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 Brian, so far so good. And then at this point, they say, time out, stop. All right, I've heard enough, Brian. Now I'm going to tell you why everything you said is true, but I still don't think that letting in a lot more immigrants is a good idea. And this is saying, yes, fine, we get these effects of global production, but there are very important offsetting concerns. Now, I don't have time to go over all of them, but I'm going to go over the ones that people bring up the most often, and then in the q and I'm happy to deal with any others. So, topping the list, number one, protecting U.S. taxpayers. All right, sure, yes, we're getting more production, but U.S. taxpayers are going to be bled dry by a bunch of immigrants that are coming here to go on welfare. Second one, protecting U.S. culture. Saying, yes, fine, we're going to have more stuff, but our culture is going to be so damaged that I'd rather be in a country 
that was much more about remaining the culture that I know and love. And then the last one that people often bring up, especially among my closest friends, is, look, this all sounds good, but we need to protect American liberty. And some of these people even say, look, what's really what's going on is we have to protect the goose that lays the golden eggs. The reason why immigrants are coming is because we have a relatively functional political and economic system. It's relatively functional because American voters aren't as bad as other voters around the world. This is where the oh, G. I've been watching TV, I'm starting to worry. But anyway, all right, well, however bad the ones here are, they're worse than other countries, so there's that. Right? And this is one where you don't even really have to, it, it, people do feel a bit uncomfortable. It's like, well, like half the voters in this country are terrible, but the other half are saving us from Armageddon, and we don't want to tip the scales, whatever those might be. All right, so how serious are these objections? How serious are these objections? All right. uh, so let's just start with the protecting taxpayers. Uh, there's a simple story here which makes perfect sense. And it says, look, the American welfare state pays more for idleness than many countries pay for work, which is totally true. You can go to a bunch of countries on Earth and see what a hardworking person makes there, and then come to the U.S. and see what someone on welfare makes. Say, well, the person on welfare in the U.S. out-earns the, per the hardworking person in India not by a small amount, maybe by a factor of five. All right, so if you were in India and you were working really hard and then you find out there's another country where you can go on welfare and make five times as much money, sound like a good deal? It sounds like a good deal. All right, and then the implication is therefore immigrants come to abuse the system. All right, so is this true? All right, well, obviously if you look around you can definitely find individuals that have done this, but is this statistically normal? Is this a correct description of how the numbers are actually working out? Uh, well. Uh, so in order to go over this, I'd have to go over some very detailed numbers, which I do in my book, and you can, you know, actually, the main source that I rely on come from the National Academy of Sciences. You can go over the data very closely yourself if you're so inclined. But if you go over the numbers, the usual result is actually, first of all, the immigrants that come to the U.S. right now more than, care, more than, more than pay for themselves. That is, they pay more in taxes than they use in benefits. And secondly, that if we look at even lower skilled immigrants, as long as they come when they're younger, they also still pay for themselves. Basically, the immigrants that seem like they are a net burden of U.S. taxpayers are old, low skilled immigrants. All right. Now, if you're wondering, like, how can this be exactly? How can this be? The answer is that most of the money in the U.S. system of government that gets handed out to people for not working does not go to the poor at all. It goes to the elderly. So we pay more than twice as much for old age programs as for poverty programs, and immigrants tend to be young which means that they are many decades away from collecting the really big payments. You say, well, isn't that just kicking the can down the road? In a sense, however, here's a key, a key fact of finance. When you kick cans down the road in finance, they get smaller. All right? Like if you could do, just say, hey, I'm going to go and pay, and pay my mortgage in 20 years and, there, and it doesn't accumulate any interest during that time, would you like to do that? Yeah, so it's the same idea with if you let in a migrant, he pays taxes for, or for 40 years, and then he starts collecting. Well, during that time, he was paying money into the system, and that money was basically earning interest and allowing him to go and support a bunch of other people. All right. So anyway, the, so I mentioned the National Academy of Science estimates. Now, if you think these are absurd, right, and you know, say like almost no serious researcher finds a big negative fiscal effect of immigration. There is a range, because this is actual empirical research. And when you do actual empirical research in the real world, you, there are discrepancies and different methods that give you so many different answers. But nevertheless, still, the range goes from moderately negative up to about break even, up to moderately positive, up to quite positive. Now, this seems absurd. Something else to remember is that a lot of government spending is what economists call non-rival. What this means is that the cost of a service does not depend on population. Right? So, classic examples: national defense. If the United States had a baby boom. Would anyone say that we need to go and, and increase the size of the military to protect the new babies? Like, these new babies are vulnerable. We have five million new babies. Who's taking care of them? The same military that's taking care of them of, of us before is taking care of them too, at no additional charge. All right, so, and the same thing goes for the national debt. Like whenever countries talk secession, they immediately talk about how we divide the national debt. And if a country can secede from another, Without having to take any debt with them, secession is a fantastic deal. Like if Scotland could break away from the UK debt-free, this would mean that the members of Scotland basically escape like 60,000 pounds of debt per Scot, 
And then who winds up having to pay all the remaining debt that gets shoved back onto the rest of them? People don't leave. Well, immigration is basically like secession, where some people are able to leave, and what do they do? They leave their home country, and they come here, and they start helping us. Now, final point. Even if the complaint were true, even if you say I'm very skeptical about the numbers, which, again, uh, you don't know who I am, probably, so why would you trust me? Right? You know, maybe you trust the National Academy of Sciences more. You think they have more prestige than I do. I don't know. But uh, anyway, um, even if the complaint were true, how about this? Why not freely admit immigrants but restrict their eligibility for benefits? Which we already actually do in many ways. There are a lot of benefits right now you have to wait five years to get, for example. Right? There are other countries that restrict benefits much more. If you look at the countries that have the very highest foreign-born shares, namely the Gulf monarchies, like Kuwait is 85% foreign-born. If you go to those countries, if you are a citizen, then you get piles of money from the government from the petroleum money. On the other hand, if you are not a citizen, then you don't. Right? So if Kuwait had to share that oil money with every every migrant, do you think they'd be letting they let their country become 85% foreign? Probably not. Like, why do the people come if they don't get a share of the Kuwaiti oil money? Oh, probably to get a job that pays five times what a job pays in Pakistan. That's probably good, good enough for them. All right, then there is protecting American culture. So this complaint says, look, immigrants are destroying American culture, they won't learn English, they won't fit in. The uh, problem with cultural complaints is they're often vague. So it's like, well, what does it exactly mean? What is it about the culture of the, of the migrant that is objectionable? And how do we know whether they are keeping their culture or not? All right, so there's a lot of research on the most measurable kinds of culture, like language acquisition. So for language acquisition, we really do have good data. And what the data says is that first-generation migrants today, if they come as adults, very rarely achieve fluency. This was also true 100 years ago. Learning a new language as an adult to the level of fluency is extremely hard. So the immigrants at Ellis Island rarely did it, the immigrants today rarely did it. However, if you look at second generation immigrants, the kids of first generation or first generation migrants who come as kids, then today as in the past, almost all of them do achieve fluency, the English fluency. And in fact, a lot of them wind up losing their native language. The main difference between Spanish speaking migrants and other migrants is Spanish speakers are the main group in America where the second generation immigrants are actually genuine, genuinely bilingual, right? And then it takes one more generation before they lose the other language. All right, now, uh, when I talk about this, people will often say, I mentioned Ellis Island, people say, ah, Ellis Island. Well, back in those days, when someone came to the US, they really left their old country behind and that was it, and they had no choice but to assimilate. Why? Because transportation was so much worse, communication was so much worse, and this is true. Right? When someone came from Sicily in 1900, they were not likely to be going back and forth to Sicily a lot. They were not likely to be able to stay in an Italian-speaking bubble for the rest of their lives. Right? So that is one way in which assimilation works less well than in the past. However, that's only part of the story. There is another way in which communication and transportation have made assimilation work a lot better. Namely, now there are a lot of people who have never been in the United States who still know all about it and speak fluent English because they learned about it from television, from movies, from the internet. Right? So I call this pre-assimilation. There are a lot of people who are already very familiar with first world cultures, societies, economies, who have never lived there, thanks to modern transportation and communication. All right. Now, uh, even if this complaint were true, so why not just admit anyone who passes an English fluency exam, a cultural literacy test, or what have you? Now, by the way, I do have one other informal test that I like to do. This is not official research. This is just what I've seen. So I say, I say, if you want to get the real stories of assimilation, ask an immigrant parent what they think. Ask any immigrant parent what they think about the assimilation of their kid to American culture. I have yet to meet an, meet an immigrant parent who says, say, you know, has something like, you know, you know, you know my, my, son, my son is, he's grown up in America, but all he cares about is India. India is the only thing that makes any difference to my son. Right, you know, he cares about cricket, he doesn't care about American football at all. You know, you know, he's, you know, you know, my grandchildren all speak perfect Hindi, it's great. Never, I've never heard this. Instead, every immigrant parent that I've ever talked to has given me a litany of woe and just said, you know, they don't speak, my, my son won't talk to me in my own language, he'll listen, and he understands, but he won't talk back. My grandchildren don't speak a word of the language, they don't care anything about the history, they don't care anything about the culture. Now, my, my editor actually told me to cut this part of the book out and said, you're going to scare people who don't want assimilation. And I said, well, this is just true, so I'm just going to say it. 
right? I know my wife is Romanian immigrant, and she speaks English, she speaks Romanian with an American accent. She does not speak English with a Romanian accent, and she did. She came here when she was seven, right? And even she only does not speak her letter perfect Romanian. But her English, on the other hand, you would have no idea. All right, and here is a page of the book. Uh, so many people that are not my fans have said, and Brian is really stupid, he believes in magic dirt. Magic dirt. Magic dirt is like someone comes from Mexico, and when they step over the Rio Grande, they touch the magic dirt on the American side, and then, ah! All right, and then suddenly they speak perfect English, and they're ready to be an investment banker. All right, that's the story that's been attributed to me. And just to be clear, I do not believe this story. I don't believe the dirt's magic. I say what is magic, though, is the culture. There is a magic culture, and the way the magic works is like this. You can take someone from a very backward and authoritarian country, move them to the United States, and within a very short amount of time, they assimilate enough to become productive members of society. Maybe they're working as a chef at a Chinese restaurant. Maybe they're taking care of kids, and they don't speak English yet. But they still are producing and contributing. And then, you say, well, that's not that magical, really. It's semi-magical. But then the real magic, their kids. Their kids assimilate almost fully. Right? And that's why I have a picture here of a baptism, except Uncle Sam is doing the baptism. And he's taking foreign born baby dressed in white. And then he comes out with the red, white, and blue. Right? So I've heard about Texas secession, so maybe why they come out with Lone Star State flag, but I don't know, whatever. <laughs> All right. Okay, now we come to the one that, again, is probably nearest and dearest to the hearts of my friends, which is protecting American liberty. So this is the most popular excuse for why we don't want to let, him, uh, let immigrants in, or at least a lot, not a lot more, among conservatives and libertarians. It says, look, immigrants come from status countries. They come from countries where government runs everything, and they're going to eagerly vote to ruin our country, our country as well. Now, if you know my first book, The Myth of Rational Voter, you realize I'm sympathetic to this argument. Because in this book, what I, in that book, my first book, what I say is, most of the problems with democracy are really problems with voters. See, if voters were reasonable, sensible, economically literate, evidence-based thinkers, politicians would also be like that. Right? If politicians were, try were trying to win a debate in front of the National Academy of Sciences, they would give a different debate. There'd also probably be different people running for office, actually. <laughs> right? But that aside, if you're talking to quantitative people, you're probably going to say quantitatively sensible things. If you're trying to win the favor of people who think in terms of supply and demand, you're probably going to mention supply and demand. So, similarly what I say in that book is the main problem with democracy comes down to the voters are not just ill-informed or ignorant. Say, that's not so bad because an ignorant person can be humble about it and say, gee, shucks, I don't know much about this economic stuff. I guess I'm not going to, try, I'm not going to go and vote based upon what people say about it because I'm not fit to judge. I don't know enough. Right. Well, that person isn't going to do any harm when they vote on economics because they don't. All right. But, um, yes, but, 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 but uh, what I really say is the real problem is even worse is that people are irrational. It's not just that they don't know. It's that the people who know very little but feel like they've got all the answers. And again, I do come back to my dad, who is a very smart guy, PhD in engineering. I'm sure I can tell you he's never cracked open an economics book. But he thinks he's got all the answers to economics. Every single one. Right? And the fact that his son got a PhD in the subject counts for zero to him. Right? Absolutely nothing. You know, like I, I talk to him, yeah, sure, sure, yeah, I bet you know what you're talking about. I like, look, well, maybe I don't, but give me a little credit here. Nope, no credit. <laughs> All right. When he tells me how to build a missile, I believe, he's also an anti car collector. When he tells me what to do to my car, yes, sir. You know, but anyway, well, at least he tells me how, how to not get ripped off at the Repair shop. All right, so now what can we actually say about this argument? It's reasonable, but is it out of it? How out of it does it actually hold up in the data? All right, now what's strange here is this is an argument that many people have stated, but almost no one has done any research on. Ben has done some, I've done some. It's hard to find someone that actually believes the argument strongly who has, who has looked at the numbers. Right? Uh, I say that's not a coincidence. Because right, if you did look at the numbers, you would see that the story is quite different from what people make it say. So, you know, when it comes down to this, uh, the problem is greatly overstated. So, first of all, non natives have low turnout, even controlling for other factors. So, if you think that they do vote poorly, you should at least be happy that they vote rarely. Right? And a further point 
Uh, there is good, not, not all approved, but good evidence that immigrants actually reduce native support for the welfare state uh, because people do not like voting to help out groups. Now, this has caused much distress over in Scandinavia. Because in Scandinavia, there are a number of social scientists who work on this question, and they come look at the numbers and they say, you know, oh, well, oh, oh gee, we, 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 we really like immigrants here in Sweden, but all, it also seems that they undermine support for the Swedish welfare state, whatever shall we do? Right? And they are, they are, and I say, like, that's the kind of research I tend to believe, because when someone finds something they don't want to find, what do they usually do? Try to redo the research and check for errors. What am I doing wrong? It can't be the fun thing I'd like to fix with another thing that I like. So that's the kind of research that tends to be gone over with a fine tooth comb. And they still come away saying, oh, well, whatever shall we do? <laughs> so now, this is a problem for people who like immigrants but also like the welfare state. If, on the other hand, you are someone who likes immigrants and does not like the welfare state, then you can say, oh, great, this is a twofer. I get two things that I like simultaneously. Right now, I hear people say, well, but at the cost of undermining the you know, trust and the you know, sense of community, this is where I honestly have to say, look, you know, if you're a free market person, you really do have to think that community can go too far. Community can go too far. Like, like, you know, you know, like if, for example, you wanted to go and climb Mount Everest, how would your family feel about that? Not good, I know I would not support that. Right. Now, if there was a vote on in, within your family about whether you could do this thing, how do you think the vote would turn out? No. No, your parents are not going to vote to let you climb Mount Everest. So if society were like a family, what would you really what freedom would you really have if everyone loved you like your parents loved you? Probably you wouldn't have very much freedom because everything you're doing, they're like, oh I don't know if that's a very good idea. I don't know if you should be going to that talk. Couldn't you just watch Brian Kaplan online and be a little bit safer? I feel a lot better about that. It's like, yeah, but I want to have my freedom and to do things and spread my wings. I want to be free, Mom. Well, that's all well and good, but I don't really. All right, so that is what a society that is like a family is like. You know, a society that is like a family is very unlikely to be like a free society. To have a free society, you need to have, a, have, a, have it be based upon mutual respect not uh, for, for other people and realize that uh, you know, your life is not mine to rule over. And, you know, I say, and furthermore, like you are not, you, know, you are not my responsibility to take care of. Each person really needs to primarily focus on running their own life. And it's not my business what you do, but at the same time, it's not my problem if, you're, if your choices wind up turning out badly for you. That's what a free society is about, and that is what I say immigration gives us more of. And it is very striking in Scandinavia, the welfare states there were at their absolute peak when almost everyone there was blonde, right? You know, you know, the very idea that a fellow speed might go and take advantage of us and claim fellow benefits, right? There, you know, that was their mentality. But you know, once there are Somalis and Iraqis and Swedes, like, well, maybe they would. Maybe we need to consider possible restrictions. <laughs> and that is a, a lot of the common standard story there about why they have cut back in the welfare state is because they no longer feel like a national family. Which is good, because if you feel like a family, you will not be free. Right? And then finally, even if this complaint were true, why not just admit immigrants to work and live, but not to vote? All right, now last. Uh, here's what I'll say. If, the, if you know, this research that we're talking about is even roughly correct, and by the way, in this book, I did not go and do the dirty-handed thing of looking only for people that agree with me and then saying that's what the research shows. Hand to God, I did not do that. I am a voracious reader. When I look at a subject, I try to read everything I can possibly find about the subject. Whether I agree with it, disagree with it, I just want to know what is everybody, what does everybody have to say? And when I write the book, I try to write it in that spirit. My editor multiple times said, why do you have this panel in there? It's just saying an argument that makes you look wrong. I said, yeah, because they, they make a good point. Right? I'm not going to go and try tricking readers and pretending like the good points against me don't exist. I'm going to face them head on. I'm going to say this is what the evidence says and how do I deal with it and maybe it's not going to be comfortable but that's what real research is about. Right. Anyway, I say that if this research that I'm relying on is even roughly correct, that all the leading moral theories you've heard of do seem to require open borders, and including utilitarianism. If you need to do whatever maximizes human happiness, it sure seems like letting people live and work wherever they want fits the bill. Uh, egalitarianism, like we want to go and 
make inequalities be to the benefit of the worst off people. Something like that seems to fit the bill. Uh, libertarianism. We know that I have libertarians saying, well, this is our country, we can do what we want in it, including keep people out from other countries. I'm like, if that's what you think, then why are you libertarians? Like, so if you say, look, it's my, I don't have to let people into my house if I don't want to, why should we have to let people into our country if we don't want to? All right, well, you don't have to let someone open up a store in your house, therefore people should need the permission of the government to open up a store. It's the same argument. Right, so can I open up an international trade depot in your backyard? No. You need my permission. All right, so therefore, shouldn't you need the permission of the government to go and trade with other countries? Again, it is the same arguments. All right, and again, it comes down to the government is not the rightful owner of everything in the United States. It is the rightful property of the individual owners and it is not collective property. All right, then there's economic efficiency. It goes without saying meritocracy. You know, what, is, what are immigration restrictions? It is international affirmative action. It is saying that you could not hire the best person for the job. You must hire the best American for the job. The best person, you know, too bad, he doesn't have the right papers. And the last one, probably of some interest here in Texas, Christianity, right? So you know the story of the Good Samaritan? And what is the moral of the, the, moral, the, moral of the story? Who is my neighbor? Is it the people on my street? Is it the people in my town? Is it the people in my county? Is it the people in Israel? Is it the people in the Middle East? The people in Eurasia? No, your neighbor is every human being on earth. Or so the standard reading would seem to say. And then there's a last view, just to mention briefly. This view, sometimes called citizenism, it just says, look, forget other people in other countries, tough luck for them, we should just do whatever is best for us. And I'll say, like, even if that is your view, then it would seem to recommend open borders combined with pro-native tax and transfers so that immigrants come here, but they pay us for the privilege. All right, so I will stop here. Thank you very much.